Welcome to 30 Experts in 30 Days, where we help entrepreneurs learn how to attract loyal clients and build their businesses by learning to serve smart. Today, we have Robert Rose with us. Robert is in the business of helping marketers become stellar storytellers. He is the Chief Strategy Officer for the Content Marketing Institute and Senior Contributing Consultant for Digital Clarity Group. Robert helps develop content marketing and customer experience strategies for large companies, helping them to tell their story more effectively. As an author, Robert's new book, Experiences, The Seventh Era of Marketing, has been called a treatise on the call of arms and a self-help guide for creating the experiences that consumers will fall in love with. He also co-hosts the podcast, This Old Marketing, with Joe Polizzi, who we interviewed earlier in the series, and also co-authored Managing Content Marketing which is widely considered the owner's manual of the content marketing process. As a storyteller, Robert is a frequent keynote speaker and web marketing expert advising top professionals in the successful strategy of content marketing and customer experiences. Welcome, Robert. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great, Leah. How are you? I, I'm With that introduction, I, I better know what the heck I'm talking about here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, can you give us a little bit of background about how you got involved in content marketing and customer experience and what led you to become such an expert? Sure. Well, I, you know, who knows? I mean, expertise is always just a factor of how old you are, I find. But uh, <laughs> it's uh, I, I've been in marketing for about 25 years and, and most of it, quite frankly, in the digital space. Um, I started in the entertainment business, working in television companies and, and, and various forms of TV networks and that sort of thing, which is where I really cut my teeth in marketing. And then in the early 2000s, I actually ran content and, and marketing for a CMO of a software company here in Los Angeles. And that's where I really discovered this idea of being able to use content to move the business forward, sort of creating a strategy with how to use valuable content to differentiate the business because we were a small little startup company and I was trying to really drive a lot of value and really differentiate against at that time our competitors were IBM and Microsoft and Oracle and we were seven guys in a garage and so weirdly it worked mm -hmm. and here we are you know nine years later I met this guy Joe Polizzi who was talking about the same thing I was talking about out on the conference circuit. He was really talking about it from the perspective of being in the publishing business. And I was speaking about it uh, from the bit, you know, perspective of being in front of the marketing practitioner side of the world. And he and I got along famously. We, you know, we became friends right away, started talking about doing some work together. And really that's how it all began. I, I sort of was ready to leave that company that I was working for. And I ended up joining with Joe as the chief strategy officer of Content Marketing Institute. And he and I wrote a book together. And really, it's been a six year journey of sort of evangelizing and, and, and out there sort of helping businesses operationalize the process of content marketing in their business. Excellent. Well, thank you. Now, you talk often in your book, Experiences, the Seventh Era of Marketing, <laughs> of moving from products to providing experiences for customers. Right. Would you explain what you mean by this and share a couple examples of businesses who have made this transition? Sure. So really what it is, is when we look at what's changed over the last, oh, call it, you know, certainly 15 years when digital has really come in and disrupted everything. But even in the last seven or eight years as channel fragmentation, you know, social and digital and television and print and everything we think of, of where people aggregate and talk about and research their, you know, their needs for products and services has completely split apart. And so what's really changed there is, is this idea of what customers are actually buying. And it used to be when we would set customer expectations or when we were trying to develop relationships with customers, we had a couple of different responsibilities as marketers. One was to go out and advertise and pull in people into our store or into our e-commerce shopping cart or into our funnel if we're a B2B marketer and really drive them into that. And then quite frankly, we sort of washed our hands, right? It was up to the salespeople. It was up to the e-commerce channel. It was up to the sales associates in the stores to actually do something valuable with that customer and turn them into customers. Well, that has changed, right? It has changed ever. You know, our expectations as consumers has changed certainly in the way that we deal with brands now across social and mobile and all the different things. And certainly our expectations about the kind of information we can find as part of our research process to buy a product or service. And so with those changes comes an inherent responsibility for marketing's responsibility to increase. 
the buyer's journey to increase. And so now marketers are not only responsible for pulling leads into the funnel, they're also responsible for nurturing them, from turning them into cross-sold and upsold, and then ultimately evangelical people who want to share our story across all the social channels that we you know, will never have the capacity to be on. And so if you look at it that way, you start to say, okay, great, the products and services we create are not where the loyalty lies. The loyalty and our ability to deliver an amazing customer experience lies in our ability to create a great experience at every single one of those touch points. From the first time we meet that customer to the time that we nurture them to the time that they are actually do decide to become a customer and the time that they decide to actually become loyal and share our story. And so it doesn't matter what business you're in, whether you're in retail or B2B or pharmaceutical or manufacturing, the structure, the, the experience is really the differentiator these days. Our product and service because of technology and digital can be duplicated anywhere in the world. But the experience that we create is really what is the heart of that, right? You think of the mm -hmm. classic examples like Uber or Airbnb that are completely reinventing the way that hotel services are delivered or the way that taxi services are delivered. And the same thing is happening across every business. And it's up to us as marketers to create those experiences that differentiate us and move us further into the market. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Now, we don't want to create just any experience. We <laughs> recommend yeah. infusing the experience we create with a shared brand purpose. That's right. What are the most common obstacles businesses face when you know trying to do this and share can you share a few tips for to overcome these obstacles sure well the the you know the the classic one is when we look at our brand and, and it's amazing to me actually how few companies really understand their brand right so when we think of brand it's really about the promise that we make to deliver value to a consumer. And it's the why we're in business to begin with, right? It's not just a logo. It's not just a tagline. It's actually a promise that we create. It's the value that we create for that consumer. That's truly at the heart of what we think of as brand. Now, tied in intimately with that is what we do to create the experience we're gonna create. And so when we think about why we're in business to begin with, that's really the heart of the brand and the value that we're going to deliver to the consumer. Well, so should that content driven experience or the physical experience we're trying to create. It should deliver on the promise of that brand. And so first we have to understand what our brand stands for. Like, why are we in business to begin with? What value do we actually bring beyond our product or service, right? Our product or service solves a particular problem or it solves a particular want for a customer. Now that's great but what does our brand deliver? What value does our brand deliver? Like when you think of Apple, you think of the brand delivers sort of a, an ability to have a lifestyle around a digital, you know, a, a digital lifestyle, right? Whether that's taking pictures, having music in your pocket, having the ability to work anywhere, et cetera, et cetera. That's Apple's sort of brand promise, but the products they make supports that. And then the content they create supports that. And so that's really at the heart of what I mean by getting to that, that brand purpose and then aligning it with your content purpose. It needs to be value delivered that's separate and discreet from your product or service. It's value. So, you know, your product or service is great. Do that. Describe that. All have all the features and benefits and taglines and all of that. But the content needs to deliver value separate and discreet from that product or service. Oh, excellent. Now, rather than spend much of our effort creating content to share with our audience, uh, what practical tips can you share to instead use part of that time creating great customer experiences that our customers will then, you know, spread our message to our audience? Sure, it's a, and it's a great and it's a great point because you know today with as many mobile and social channels that erupt every single day you know we have lo and snapchat and meerkat and periscope and all of these different channels that are sort of emerging every single day it can be overwhelming about where we want to put our content and so the typical knee-jerk reaction to that is well let's just create more we'll just create more we'll bring in other people we'll bring in agencies they'll help us do all of this they'll help us create this mountain of content we have to create and instead it's we have to take a step back because Creation of content may be one of the things that you need to do across some of the channels that are emerging. The real key is discovering what it is our customers need from a value proposition perspective. Start with that customer experience 
and then working backwards to understand what makes up that customer experience. Some of it may and probably will be content, but some of it, quite frankly, may be training our store associates to do something in a better way. A great example of this is we worked with a pet store and the pet store said, we want to create an amazing education experience on our website. We said, great, that's wonderful because our new brand proposition is going to, we, we are the place where you go for authoritative information about pets. And we said, great, that's awesome. So they said, we're going to create this awesome blog that's going to be in-depth information about pets. Great, wonderful. But the problem was whenever you walked into the pet store and they were buying an iguana or you're buying a parakeet or something like that. And the dad whose kid was saying, buy me the iguana, buy me the iguana was saying, how do I feed this thing? Well, the 17 year old store associate was going, I don't know, let me oh. Google it for you. And you've just broken that brand. You've broken the story. You've broken the experience with that. And so the priority then becomes not to create a blog, but to create some internal content channel that actually makes the store associates better so that they can actually be the conduit for your story first, mm -hmm. then build the blog to supplement the ability for you to inform your salespeople. So that's so figuring out where to solve the problem first to deliver a great, compelling experience is the first step to, you know, to actually, you know, to actually succeeding at it. Oh, that's an excellent example. Thank you. Because it, it is easy to just go for, um, the most visible thing, but you know, really stepping back and identifying, you know, what are all our touch points with our customers, and right. you know, are we addressing them all, or are we getting a little more narrow focused and missing some of the most important ones? Exactly, exactly. Now, in your book, experiences the seventh area of marketing. Actually, you know, before I go forward, I should, I should let you share <clears throat> why is it called experiences the seventh area era of marketing. Well, because if you look, so I'm a student of marketing and specifically marketing history of sort of where we go, you know, in the classic Steve Jobs, I don't think you can understand where you're going unless you really understand where you've been. And so what Carla and I did was when we were writing the book, we actually went back to look. And if you went to university for marketing, which I did a bit, and it's interesting how few people actually go to classical university for marketing these days, you know, we come from all sorts of different backgrounds. What you learn about in the textbooks are what's classically known as the five eras of marketing, which starts with, um, you know, it, it, it goes from the trade era in the late 1800s into the production era of mass industrialization of the early 20s to the sales era of the early 30s and the Great Depression to the marketing department era, which is classically the Mad Men era of the 40s, 50s and 60s into the marketing company era, which is the classic brand or global brand strategies of the 70s, 80s and up into the early 90s. And then what we've technically been in, but it's not in most of the textbooks, but most of the marketing scholars would uh, would posit that we have been in the relationship era for the last 15 years. And each of the eras, by the way, lasts somewhere between 15 and 20 years. And so if you look at the last 15 or 20 years, really since the mid 90s as the relationship era, as we start to get into an era where data is ever more important, and the protection of consumer data. Most consumers, if you ask them, don't want marketers to use their data. So it's going to become increasingly harder to use it to deliver better services or to actually deliver personalized services. Two, the expectations of relationships are increasing. You know, our level of outrage over customer indignities are, are, are so low these days, right? You know, the flight attendant is mean to us. So we're never flying your airline again, right? So our level of outrage has decreased. And so as expectations have increased, our ability to track data becomes ever more complex. We feel like we're moving into a new era where the, the really the ability to delight audiences with content driven experiences will become the differentiator of how marketers successfully take their product and service to market. And so we call it experiences because it's about the consumer experience and creating that consumer experience is truly the focus of what we believe marketing will be focused on in the next 15 or 20 years. So that's the, that's the source for the title. Of the <laughs> Excellent. So, you know, in your book, you wrote that our nemesis isn't our perceived competitors. It's our customers short attention spans. What advice can you share to help businesses connect with their audience despite customer short attention spans? Sure. And, you know, and to be clear, when we say short attention spans, it's the short attention span in order to get their attention 
not necessarily to hold it, right? You know, I'm one of the things that I'm completely tired of seeing at every conference I go to is the goldfish slide, right? Where everybody says we only have the attention span of a goldfish these days. No, that's not true. We have a better attention span than a goldfish. We, it just, it takes more interesting things for us to hold our attention these days. We have the ability to use long form content to be able to engage an audience to the point where they want to engage with us in a length of time. We have that capability. And so the real question and, I, and the heart of your question is really how do we start to do that? And it's because we're not competing against our competitors, right? Our competitors may or may not be good at producing high quality content, but we have to be good at getting our consumers attention and vying for that attention over cat videos and people getting kicked in the you know what and all these different things that are out there you know trying to grab our consumers attention the one advantage we have as a brand and when we start thinking of brand as media or brand as a media company or using content to get the attention of consumers and deliver that value the one advantage we have over media companies we don't have to be big we don't have to go viral we don't have to be a huge set of eyeballs. We have to be very focused and deliver value in a very focused and niche way to our customers when they actually need that value. And if we can create an experience for when our customers need that particular value and we can deliver it to them, that's how we can compete against the cat videos. Because quite frankly, at some point, they're going to get tired of the cat videos and go look for something to help them be a better person, help them be a better professional in their job, help them get to a market leading position in their industry. And if it's our content they find and we can grab that attention and hold it at that point, we win every single time. Mm -hmm. And that's the real key is how can we position something and get something and, de and, and deliberately create something of high quality value to a very focused and niche audience and deliver it when they need it. And that's the, that's the real key of how to compete in today's noisy market. Well, and that was one of the questions I was going to talk to you about was the fact that, you know, you do talk about in your book that it's not about having your information everywhere, you know, all the right. time. It's about getting the information to the right people at the right place at the right time when they need it. That's exactly How do right. we go about identifying? I think we, you know, certainly covered in the interview series, identifying who our target customer is, but yeah. how do we identify, um, you know, when and where to connect with them when they need it? It's a great question. And, and one of the, one of the things that I'll often differ with many of my colleagues who will be out on the conference circuit or at speaking engagements and they'll talk about following your audience, basically going to where your audience is. I think that's a flawed strategy. Um, and the reason is, is because our audience, we think about all of the different platforms you try, right? We all have tried the LO or the Meerkat or the Periscope or the Snapchat or the WhatsApp or the, you know, all of these different apps and things and channels and YouTube and Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook. We all try it. Some of them stick, some of them don't. And so we may discover that our audience is on any one or myriad channels, but following them is a fool's game because you never know when that channel leaves, they're gonna go out of style. Our audience may leave. And so you're constantly chasing your tail. Instead, audiences will gather, they will come to a place that you determine, that you orchestrate if you can create the value there. You know, if you think about all the great content marketing examples, none of them are really sort of, well, we went out and found them on Facebook, so we built on Facebook. No, they said, we're going to build an amazing blog, or we're going to build an amazing website, or we're going to build a set of amazing online tools, or we're going to build an industry-leading thought leadership resource center. And they said, we're going to build this here. Now, we're going to use all those channels to promote this center of gravity. We're going to promote this thing using social and mobile and media and email and YouTube. And, you know, and we're going to do that, but we're going to build our house on our own land where we can build an audience, which is the asset we're really trying to build here, build that audience over time and use all those other channels to sort of advertise the concert as it will. And, mm -hmm. and sort of use paid owned and earned strategies to pull that audience in. That's a much more cohesive strategy to operate from. And ultimately what it means is that as you orchestrate that thing, you can't be everywhere. You simply can't be. You don't have the resource. I don't care how big your company is. You don't have the resources to be everywhere that's going to emerge. 
but you do have the resources and the intelligence and the creativity to be anywhere your audience is and pull them into your owned media property and start to build value and build an audience so that you aggregate that over time and it builds value over time. That's the, that's the real difference here. Oh, excellent advice. Because I mean, ultimately, if we can create a, a home, a destination for them to come to, to participate in, to experience, <clears throat> then we can take advantage of them referring others and then exactly. sharing the message if exactly we've created right. something quality. And, it, and it's a great point there because, you know, so what, one of the examples of this that I absolutely love, um, what Brian Clark has been able to do at Copy Blogger. So if mm -hmm. you look at Copy Blogger as a small business that has become quite frankly, a, a pretty good size business over time, they killed their Facebook page. So why did they do that, right? Everybody's saying, no, no, you have to have a Facebook strategy. You have to have a Facebook strategy. And what they discovered when they started to look was that, yes, on Facebook, all of the traffic they were getting was from people sharing their articles from their blog on Facebook. It wasn't from people going to their Facebook page and saying, oh, let's engage and let's have fun and let's do it here. No, they were saying they were on their article. Click, I want to share this on my Facebook page. And, and so they have a Facebook presence but by creating such a strong center of gravity around their blog and their content, they don't have to be on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And then you go all the way to the end of the spectrum on that and you look at Apple. Apple doesn't blog. Apple doesn't really have a social media strategy of any sort of scale. They don't have to. They have created such a strong narrative with their content and their center of excellence around that content. We're more than willing to share their story across all these different platforms for them. That's the brass ring that we're trying to really reach for here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. If, if we can create something that magnetizes people <clears throat> and, you know, creates those evangelists, then they, we can put the effort into that and then they will help spread the word. And that's just, and that's a channel that we don't have to put our energies into and if we don't have to put our energies into that channel, we get to we get the benefits of it without having to be there. And it's a mm -hmm. it's that's that's just the that's just a great thing. Well, and it's a simple principle. I mean, if you try to spread yeah. yourself too thin, you don't do anything well. <laughs> that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Now, in discussions about creating customer experiences, a topic that you know rightly comes up often is the need to align the various departments and levels within a business. Yep. And alignment is vital to make all the employees within the company, make sure they're sending the same message to the customer and that they're working together to create a smooth experience for the customer. But that's much easier said than done. <laughs> you know, you talk ab about the need to think of ourselves as unifiers. What are some common mistakes made that lead to, you know, silos and what advice can you share to help us be better unifiers? Yeah, this well, and this is the classic that, you know, this is probably the biggest challenge for almost all businesses right now that have any sort of size about them, um, which is what we've done over the last seven years uh, with at businesses that have size, that have scale. Um, startups face this much less, quite frankly, because there's less people to silo. But the the idea of larger enterprises really struggle with this because, quite frankly, what we've done over the last seven to 15 years as digital is we've just thrown teams at it. And so where marketing used to be siloed off from sales and, and, and legal and operations and the CEO's office and all that, well, now we're siloed even from each other. You know, we have a social team and a social CRM team and an e-business team and a web content team and a brand team and a demand generation team and an SEO team and an email team and a Twitter team and a Facebook team. And we got all these teams that are creating content. And quite frankly, and here's the, the heart of the, the answer at the, at the heart of your question, we measure them all based on proof of life instead of improving the process. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we measure the social team by their ability to manage social. We manage the web team by their, their ability to manage the website. And we scale ourselves based on technologies and platforms. What that does is that it creates an immediate proprietariness over that content. And so if I'm the web team and I want the social team to promote my piece of content on the website, well, I run into a big barrier there because the web, the social team goes, well, no, because if I post this picture of a cute kitten hanging from a tree, I get like lots of likes and that's how I get my bonus is based on the number of likes that I get. And if I post your web content, then I don't get that many likes and I don't get my bonus because my measurement falls off. And so the classic mistake is that we measure channels by channel and then associate that with the team's performance. And instead, and it seems like such a subtle, but it's such an important shift. 
We need to be measuring the content for its efficacy across whatever channel it's going to reside on and use that effectiveness to then improve the process for how we manage and distribute and promote content. The teams will exist. And so really what we're trying to measure here is ultimately goals like sales, revenue, cost efficiencies, et cetera. The number of likes, the number of follows, the number of page views, the number of retweets, none of that matters really if we don't move the needle in another way. And so if we can get beyond that and start looking as a content as a unifier, how we utilize content as a business and how it flows through the different silos that we have, which are channel related in many cases and functional most of the time. If we can look at content, how it unifies that, it can at least start to de-silo that process within marketing. And if we can create content as a function that flows to all those different channels and functions as a, as a unifying piece, well then we start to operate as a marketing team, not as a Twitter team and a demand generation team and all of that and solving the big problems of the organization rather than just sort of the, the individual small, what I call marketing at the cubicle level. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think even for smaller companies, sometimes it may not be that we have different departments, <clears throat> but even if individuals play multiple roles within the company because they're smaller, yeah. sometimes we just get, you know, each time we're doing each task, we put, you know, we silo ourselves. And so we, need to remember that as we're working on things, are we looking at the big picture or are we just trying with each task, trying to, you know, reach a certain goal rather than the big goal? It's a, it's a great point, you know, and, and, and it's, and it's one of the things that we're classically taught, whether we go to university or not for marketing, it's one of the things that we're classically taught as marketers is to think medium first and then content second, which is when we're, when we go up and are classically trained as marketing people, we think, well, I need a print campaign. I need an email campaign. I need a web campaign. I need a TV campaign. And then we go, great. Now, how do we fill each of those full of content mm -hmm. when we can reverse that and we can start thinking about the customer experience and what value we provide its story first. And then we go, great. Now, what channels would this one story fit so we can actually reduce the amount of content we're creating and increase the repurposing and the high quality of that content across multiple channels. And, and I think that is a big thing. You know, I mean, with so much information out there, um, it is harder to get heard above all the noise. And it is the, the way to get heard isn't to produce more noise. No, it's exactly. to create, you know, yeah. real quality stuff that will, people will stop and listen to. Yeah, and so more signal. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh huh. Now, in your book, you referenced a Harvard mm -hmm. Business Review article titled mm -hmm. Rethinking the Four P's. Right. They replaced the old school marketing four P's of product, price, place, price, and promotion with a new framework. Can you explain the new framework they suggested and why you think it's applicable to us today? I do. I can. And, 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 it's, and I have to say it's, you know, it, it's written <clears throat> in partly by a guy by the name of Eduardo Conrado, who was kind enough to write uh, the foreword to our book. He is the chief innovation officer at Motorola Solutions, which is, you know, of course, the big, you know, one, one half of the Jihugic company that is Motorola. And the interesting thing to me there is one, first of all, he's an innovative, super innovative guy. And he, one of the things that he did with uh, just speaking to our previous points were he unified the idea of marketing, sales, and technology in his organization into one department. So you talk about de-siloing. He mm -hmm. basically forced the de-siloing because he understood one thing really clearly, which was marketing, sales, and the technology people in that company all had the same goal, creating a better customer experience. And so that's, you know, that's considered extraordinarily innovative in today's world, but it was really an interesting thing. And he he basically was working off of a new framework and he wrote about it in, in, in Harvard Business Review called SAVE, S-A-V-E, um, which is sort of replacing the four Ps. <clears throat> and the SAVE model is basically starts with S, which is solution instead of product. And so the reasoning behind that is basically looking at it. This is the classic. If you look at Theodore Levitt or some of the classic marketing professors who talk about the idea people don't buy a hammer or a nail, they buy a hole in the wall. That's what they're buying. They're buying the solution. So start thinking about the value of what the customer is buying or why they're buying, basically going back to our brand discussion, rather than product. Then the A is access instead of place. And the access means our customers, to our previous discussion, really expect us to be anywhere they need us to be. 
And so instead of trying to be everywhere, let's be anywhere they need them to be, but let's provide clear access to what they are trying to do in that experience. You know, there's that's a really key piece of this is customers can be led. They, they want to be led. They want to have clear identity about what the experience they should expect in any given digital channel or physical channel. And that access is really a strategy around that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the V is about value instead of uh, price. So when we think of price, it's usually around the product and the production of that product and what its price is. And then value instead is twofold. One is looking at that where we want to take the customer and then working backwards to understand how and what value should we expect that customer to be extracted mm -hmm. before we deliver that value. And that really helps us when we're thinking about marketing too, because we so often, yeah, we throw up a white paper, throw up, a, you know, throw it up behind a lead management form before they can get to it. Well, is it really that valuable? Should we need to think about what value can we deliver to that customer first before we actually understand the price we're going to ask them to pay for it, whether it be data on the marketing side or the product value on the other side. And then the last is E for save, uh, which is they call education, which is really about focusing our marketing on educating consumers rather than sort of selling them. And I would add entertainment to that. So I would actually add another E called entertainment, education and entertainment, because I also believe that there's true value in delivering an emotional response I think of Red Bull as a great example of this, right? Red Bull doesn't educate you. They just entertain you with guys jumping out of spaceships and, you know, extreme sports and all of that. So the E there is about delivering value through education or entertainment to our consumers as a way to market to them. And that replaces promotion of the, the classic four piece. So that's the save model. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful framework from which to start to organize and architect a marketing strategy. Excellent. Thank you. Now, sure. you have noted that the goal isn't to, to um, you know, we talked about to be everywhere all the time, but, you know, what are some ways that um, we can, you know, identify and reach to our, our clients, our customers, our following in a way that really connects with them? Well, it's, you know, I think the, the, the key thing there is to first sit down and understand them as people. Um, you know, very often I'll walk into a business and I'll say, so tell me about your personas. Tell me about your buyer and your audience, your influencer personas. And they'll say, oh yeah, we've got that solved. And I'll say, great, let's see it. And they'll show me some audience segmentation graph, right? They'll say, well, we target men 50 to 60 years old and they're in the C-level position and blah, blah. And they work in these kinds of companies. That's not understanding your customer as a person. That's understanding your customer as a demographic. And so it truly is going, meeting with them, understanding, sitting with them, talk not about your product, just understanding them as people. What do they actually need in their daily life? And once we start to understand that consumer as a person, we can really truly start to understand what they need and where we might be able to fill that need. Now, clearly some of that need or want is going to be in our product or service that we're bringing to the marketplace. But when we start thinking about the experience we can provide, it's amazing to me once you start to sit down with a customer and understand them as people, how much more we can solve as a business that aligns with our brand purpose and aligns with our strategy and it's value we can deliver them through content, through physical experiences, through whatever it may be, we can deliver that to them. Mm -hmm. And then by its very nature, if we deliver that value, they'll want to do business with us. They'll, they'll, we will be the inherent choice, not the sort of forced choice. You know, in other words, in the B2B, I always use this in a B2B example. If we can deliver value at every single step along the way, by the time our salesperson gets a call, that customer is not thinking, why you? They're thinking, why not you? And that's a difference, right? If we can change our, change our salespeople into content delivery vehicles of saying, why not you? Answering the question, why not you? We, we're going to start winning that battle every single time. And that's the, that's the real, it's understanding your customer at a personal level. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, because like you said, you know, there's historically it has been identifying our customers demographically. Yeah. And, you know, the problem with that is, is, you know, you talked about if you're going to provide a solution, it has to be a solution to a problem. And if you look at all 55 males, you know, that are CEOs, do they have all the same problems? Do they have all the same interests? Of course, they're not identical people. That's right. And so, you know, really knowing 
who they are and what they need enables you to serve them well. But I think you also pointed out a good thing is that um, if we're going to get to know them, we need to talk to them. Right. And it's not just, and the key is not just talking because what we tip, what uh, many times I'll go into a business, oh yeah, no, we do talk to them. And I say, great, what, what, let's see what you talk to them about. And then they pull up the research study where they watch them use the product in a room where they actually observe them like they're in a bird cage or something. And they said, see, we actually met with them and we, sh we watched how they use it. That's not getting to know your customer. Even though you met with them, if the conversation was solely around your product or service and why they were happy or sad or mad or had great things to say about it, that's not getting to know them as people. That's getting to know them as a consumer of your product. And it's a very, very different, it's a very different tone to that meeting. And it's also a very, very different set of information that comes out of that meeting. Mm -hmm. Yes, because I mean, there's lots of ways. I mean, another common one they'll do are focus groups. Yes, and exactly. I've, I've got to say, I mean, there's a, maybe a place for focus groups, but if you're really trying to understand a person, the likelihood that they're going to really open up and tell you their problems and their needs in front of a group of total strangers is probably not as high. That's right. And, that, and if you ask them about products, they'll tell you this is, you know, this is classic, you know, sort of Ford and Steve Jobs thinking, which is, you know, which the reason they didn't like focus, focus groups was because they're going to tell you they need a faster horse, not a car, right? They can't tell you about an innovative new thing because they don't know it. But what they can tell you about, if you start to get who they are, what do they do every day? How, and you can start to identify the gaps in their needs or wants, whether they realize it or not. You know, you can, you've, I, I worked with one company where they interviewed all their customers and sort of just got to know them, went to lunch with them, went to dinner and, you know, had them, you know, met them at events and, and those sorts of things. And they could start to recognize the pattern in a gap that was in this customer's life that they didn't even realize. And so they could say, hey, we could deliver training or we could deliver a thing that would solve that, but they don't even know they need it yet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that's a very good point. I mean, I think often we need to focus on knowing, you know, talking to them so we can find out their problems and needs. And then we are the ones who provide the solutions. But sometimes, sometimes even um, customers aren't totally at least clear on their needs and problems. And by talking to more of them, and getting to know them and staying in a tight niche, you can, by seeing, you know, having multiple conversations, you get a better picture of really getting the clarity to understand what really is the problem going on here for a lot of them. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Now you wrote that marketers, um, <coughs> that businesses need to create a balanced portfolio of appropriate, relevant, and high impact experiences at only the stages of the buyer's journey where we can be the most influential and deliver the most value. How do you recommend businesses identify those experiences, the ones where they can have the most high impact? It's the, you know, and, and so just to back that up, what I'm, what I'm, and to clarify what I mean by that, or what Carl and I mean by that in the book is, so the, the idea here is that what, Many and just it just goes right. It segues very nicely from our conversation here about personas, because what a lot of marketers get wrapped around the axle of is this idea of the buyer's journey. And, you know, we start to micromanage the buyer's journey to the point where every single decision we map it against some, you know, some hopefully some basis of reality. But quite frankly, it becomes so complex trying to map that content to every single step of the buyer's journey. We don't do it. We don't ever do it. And so instead of building something meaningful, what we do is we just build a lot of assets that theoretically align to some micro decision that the customer might make. That's the wrong way to go about it. Instead, what we say is pick a few strategic points and be remarkable in those strategic points. Don't worry about the in-between parts. Just make, you know, create an experience that's so strong that the only thing that customer wants to do is have another one. Mm -hmm. And they'll find their way between the two the two major checkpoints, whether they go check out the competitors, whether they go do some more research, whether they, you know, don't worry about filling that middle gap, create amazing experiences at maybe the awareness level, the nurturing level, the, you know, the loyalty level. And then the key to your question is how, where, where do we start? My answer is always, where does it hurt the most? Mm -hmm. If we can identify, because it can be completely overwhelming to say, oh my God, we've got to create five of these amazing experiences. And that's just, oh my, where would you, how are we going to do that? Don't create five to begin with, create one to begin with and think about it from this perspective, which is where does it hurt the most for us? And it might be your business. You say, well, 
once we get people in the door, our guys are great. We create an amazing experience for sales. We can close these people. We have no problem, but we have a real problem with awareness and pulling them in. Or you might say, you know what? We have no problem with awareness. We're pulling them in, but our sales guys are really dropping the ball and we really lose them in that sort of need lead nurturing process. Or you might say, what, we get in customers fine, but we're having a real struggle keeping them. We're at, you know, so figure out where it hurts the most, because quite frankly, that's the place that there's the least resistance to failing because mm -hmm. if we try something and it doesn't work and two, it's where we can move the needle the most in the shortest amount of time. Mm -hmm. And if we can create that one there that solves that, then we can sort of move to adjacent spaces and say, great, now where does it hurt the most again? Now where does it hurt the most again? And we can sort of build up and down our buyer's journey accordingly based on the priorities in our business. Well, and I, as you describe that, it also makes me wonder about asking our customers, where does it hurt the most? Because, you know, if, if I'm, you know, selling computers, you know, and I'm a customer and I'm trying to decide, you know, do I need a computer? What computer do I need? What are the solutions? What is the most frustrating part of that process? You know, and finding out from them and providing a solution to those answers um, could be, you know, equally, you know, impactful to the customer. It's a great point, you know, and the only thing I'll say to that is, is that, that, you know, one, the customer won't have a law, a good sense of the, you know, where the business is hurting, right? They may have mm -hmm. zero idea, you know, they'll have an idea about where their buyer's journey is falling down with your brand. And that's a great way to sort of, once you've drilled into the place from the inside looking out, where does it hurt the most for us right now? Where are we losing the customers? Well, then going to the customers and saying, great, now why are we falling down in this place, right? Why are we, why are we actually not delivering the experience we should? That's mm -hmm. the, seems like the second step to understanding what kind of experience we could develop to actually add value to that part of their journey. Excellent. That's great idea. Yes. Now, you recommend in the book to not focus on persuading and promoting in order to sell, but rather to think about enabling and empowering experiences. Can you share a couple examples of businesses who have done this well? Sure. And so, and, and by the way, it's, it's in addition to, right? It's not yeah. an either or proposition just to make sure. Cause I love campaign based marketing. I'm a marketing guy, advertising guy at heart. So I, I love me some good advertising. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but what I mean by that, and, and it's really this idea of delivering value to the customer to empower um, and entertain them, educate them rather than sort of persuade or cajole them into a particular uh, product or service. A great example of this is Yiska Bank. Um, they're a bank in Denmark, retail bank in Denmark, um, and they've actually reinvented their entire go-to-market strategy, including the physical presence of the bank, around a better customer experience. And so when you walk into their bank, it looks like you're walking into a coffee shop because you walk in, there's coffee, there are people walking around serving you coffee, but they also happen to be consultants who can help you figure out what your financial position is, what your financial literacy kind of rate is, what you, how to open a personal checking account. And then on the TVs they have in the bank and also online, there's a 24 seven television network that delivers financial advice through feature stories, through covering the news, but it's all around financial literacy for consumers. So it's like a CNBC or a financial channel for consumers to understand uh, financial issues. And that's their, and as they say in their tagline and they're, they're right up front about it. We're the only media company that happens to have its own bank. So they're a bank, but they're really a media company and have completely redefined the experience around creating value through content. Um, another one at a much smaller level is a company that I love called Indium, I N D I U M. And they have a, uh, an entire blog series, uh, called from one engineer to another. And what it is, is they've created this incredibly robust thought leadership blog of all the different flavorings of solder. Who knew there was different flavorings of solder, but there are. And each engineer speaks in their blog and they have 14 different blogs now talking about the different um, values of solder, which they've now translated to five or six or seven different languages. So these 14 blogs are translated into a global language. They are now the leading media company for by simply creating a blog a corporate blog that focuses on delivering this value the leading media company for their particular industry and so really they're competing with any of the magazines or trade publications in their business 
for the aggregation of an audience and creating a wonderful, valuable experience for these engineers because they can talk directly and interact directly with other engineers. It's a wonderful, wonderful program done at a very sort of medium-sized business level. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Now, you talk about categorizing content and the four content archetypes. Can you explain why it's valuable to recognize the four categories and explain, well, what the four categories are sure. and how we can use those four categories to really connect with our customers? Absolutely. So, you know, and, and by the way, I couldn't, you know, when Carl and I were, were writing the book, we couldn't resist the, the sort of poetic, you know, play on the four P's here, <laughs> which is why we have them as four P's. And if you don't like the sort of archetypal names that we came up with, please, you know, it's, it's create your own, but understand the real reason for this is to understand that as our response, as we talked about at the top of the hour here, the, when our marketing responsibilities expand, so does the purpose of the content we're creating expand. So as marketers, we've classically been trained to create one particular type of content, persuasive content, what we would call promoter content as part of our uh, archetypal uh, uh, sets of categorical content. So the promoter content is persuasive, it's ad headlines, it's features and benefits, it's calls to action, it's unique sales propositions, unique. We know how to do this, right? But it's a very, very distinct category of content. Then there are three others that we identify, poet, preacher, and professor content. And we've talked about two of them already. We've talked about the professor and the, and the poet, which are professor is highly education content, right? Thought, leadership, differentiating, distinct point of view, what Jay Bear would call utility content, content so great you'd pay for it, that educates you or gives you an education about a particular industry that makes you a better professional or just a better person. But then as we also recognize, entertainment can be differentiating as well, creating emotion. And so the poet content is really about delivering an emotional response, whether that be making you laugh, making you cry, making you feel something that you didn't otherwise. And quite frankly, poet content is the only one that's going to change your beliefs. Mm -hmm. The only way to change somebody's beliefs is to appeal to their emotion. You can't appeal to their intellect. And so if you look at that, you've got promoter, poet, uh, and, and, and then the last, which we didn't cover, is preacher, preacher content. And the preacher content is really evangelizing a particular approach. It's high velocity. This is the listicles, right? These are our high velocity preaching and approach out there evangelizing our approach to solving a customer's needs or want. It's not terribly in-depth education. It may be emotional. It may be funny or it may be educational, but it's not in-depth sort of emotional and or educational. It's simply meant to say, hi, we're here everything is you know great come on over and that is really sort of embodied in what you think of as inbound marketing right so creating content so you're found it's about being made aware and so if you look at those in context with each other the poet the preacher the professor and the poet all of those are different reasons why we would create content in a content marketing strategy now an integrated mix of those is usually best but more than which one you're going to do, it's making a conscious decision of when you're creating a piece of content about which one you're creating. Mm -hmm. Too many times we'll create a white paper and we call it a white paper because it's printed out on white paper, <laughs> but it's not a white paper because it's educational because what all we're really doing is dressing up a brochure that looks like some sort of thought leadership piece. So understanding the reasons why we're creating that content and starting to exercise that muscle a little more is really the reason behind the categories. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And I think, you know, when you talk about, you know, we were discussing earlier how, you know, having a home where you, you know, you have your main content and then you can spread the message out there. You, I can kind of see the categories because, you know, that home where you have your content, that's probably going to be a bit more of your professor. It's going to probably also be your poet there, um, you know, but then your preacher is probably going to be a little bit more of the, you know, sending the messages out to social media about that and bringing exactly them back. Exactly right. That's exactly right. You know, and so, and, and, and what I avoid doing, what we avoid doing in the book and what I try and avoid doing in any of the consulting or workshops that we do is, you know, templating that mm -hmm. because as soon as, you know, so as soon as, as soon as I say, well, you should only use 
preach your content on social media. No, that's not true. I can think of a million, you know what I mean? But, but you're absolutely right. The trend, the vast majority of the social media content is going to be preacher oriented content. But that doesn't mean that's a rule. It, it just means that that's probably the easiest way to think about it. But certainly, uh, I, you know, it's like just it, it, the, the real key here is understanding why we're creating the content to begin with and really aligning it with that purpose. And once we do that, it, boy, it does it provide a lot of clarity to, you know, the people that we're hiring, the agencies we're hiring, you agency, you're only going to prevent, you know, present our professor level content. We need this stuff to be awesomely educational and that's your goal, right? And it, it provides a real clarity around purpose. Well, and it kind of reminds me, I mean, so often with, you know, marketing and other things, you know, you talk about an ad, you're supposed to have one message. Right. Stick exactly. to one message. And, and one so, purpose. Exactly right. Great point. Mm -hmm. Now, to wrap up, I always like to ask each individual that I interview to share some hard won wisdom that <laughs> they've gained through some mistake that they've made that lost them time or money or something. Uh, what's one mistake you've made that you can share with the audience and share, you know, some advice for avoiding the same mistake? So I'll share two, actually. Um, and so the... I think the, the, the first one that I've made personally um, is not understanding that the audience doesn't always keep up with your thought process. And let me tell you what I mean by that. When you think of television shows or you think of movies these days, how often they regurgitate the same thing, right? We even have a, we have a season called rerun season in the summertime in case you missed it. And so we're so reluctant to repeat ourselves because as marketers, we're classically trained not to. We're, we're trained that if anything repeats, it's always about what have you done for me lately and it's always the bright, shiny new thing. And so that blog post that we ran in January that was great, it was awesome. Why don't we run it again in June? But not everybody saw it in June or why don't we run it again on some other magazine or why don't we let some other blog cover it? Or why don't we reuse it and re put a new angle to it and re, you know, repurpose it in a different way? Repurposing existing content that performs well is such a huge mistake that I've made in trying to recreate sort of ideas and ideas and ideas and ideas. And I go back to this blog post that I will do in 2008 and go, oh, my God, that was pretty good. I don't know why the hell I haven't, you know, done anything about that since then, but that's good. So I personally made that mistake, and it's one that I – I just, I, I absolutely, my best advice there is look at the content you're creating and don't be afraid to reuse it. You know, the whole SEO duplication thing is an overplayed, overplayed meme. The, the, if it delivers value to your consumer, do not be afraid to use that content again. And then the one that I would mention that I see often all the time is confusing content marketing for another form of sales collateral, which is we create these content marketing assets, but basically all they are are sales collateral material without logos on them. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we don't create the content, you know, as a, as a collection of assets. In other words, when we create content marketing, think about what it is you're building. Are you building a pile of bricks so that you look back at the end of the year and go, wow, we piled up a bunch of bricks there. Or are you actually building a wall or building a house or building a castle? How are you placing those bricks thematically with each other so that you look back at the end of the year after you've created 100 different blog posts or 100 different white papers or 100 different assets and go, wow, we created something really different there, dif differentiating there, an experience. That's the real key is we're building an experience with these assets. And it is the collection of assets that make the experience, not any one within it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. And I think a big part of this, what you were talking about earlier is when we reach out to our customers and understand, you know, what their needs are, you know, are we creating content that addresses those needs or are we just creating content? And right. if we identify their needs and all the parts, you know, the holes, the gaps that they have, then create a strategy to answer those questions, fill those needs. And then we've created a house, you know, almost a gateway for them to go through rather than a pile of bricks. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Excellent. Well, you know, we really do appreciate your time, Robert, today in sharing your expertise, your wisdom, and, well, your hard-won wisdom, too. <laughs> Thank you.